thank you, man of God, for, for this. Majorly, I've had a great conversation with him, and I, I love how that man thinks. He's special. <laughs> He's very special. Thank you, Bishop, and your wife, and the whole family of the Kumbanapali. And I bless God for what he's going to speak to us tonight. Father, the Bible says that the entrance of your word brings light. We thank you for the word that is going to proceed tonight to your people. And we believe that you are going to change and transform our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and believed and all saints said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Bless you. Now, um... I have had my fair share in the business world, having graduated among some of the best students in my university, went directly into banking. I banked for six years, and uh, after that I went into full-time ministry. But I have stayed a businessman because I have had my roots, my family is, is business. My father has done business for as long as I can remember. My first job was at the age of 13, so I understand this world as well. I understand it quite well. Um, I run five successful businesses because I don't want to depend on the church. I don't want to depend on the church. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God, I've, I've seen a few things that I believe, as I continue to share with us today, they will open your eyes to something bigger, something bigger, something bigger, something bigger. And um, because in the few minutes that I have, I want to open your eyes to what I want to call the biggest deception in the world when it comes to money and finances. I want to have a conversation with us. Um, says that we understand and separate ourselves from how the world makes wealth, uses wealth, to how the kingdom of God makes wealth and uses wealth. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, when the Bible speaks of the callings in the church, we usually talk about what you will call the fivefold ministry, right? Um, and he gave some to be apostles, prophets, Pastors, teachers, evangelists, for the perfection of the saints, for the work of the ministry to the edification of the body. You see? And um, allow me to disturb you a little in that thought. When you read the original Greek translation there, it says, this is how the original Greek sounds. He gave some to be apostles, to be prophets, to be evangelists, to be pastors, which be teachers. Which be teachers for the perfection of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edification of the body. So in the fivefold, interestingly, if you study the Greek, teaching is not one of the offices. Teaching is the responsibility of the other four. In fact, it's supposed to be the fourfold. You study Hebrew and look at the uh, Greek, sorry, and then look at the word and. You'll, re, you'll realize when you get to and teachers, the Greek word there is which be teachers. You see? So that means the apostle is supposed to teach, the prophet is supposed to teach, the evangelist is supposed to teach, the pastor is supposed to what? To teach. But what we don't emphasize intrinsically in this is that all these four folds are not one dimensional in thought. You see? So when you say pastor, some people think that the pastoral is only in the realm of the four walls of the church. When you say prophet, some people think that the prophetic is only in the four walls of the church. When you think uh, evangelist, some people think the evangelistic is when you get a stadium and put people in and then they say you are a wonderful word, evangelist. Some people think, oh, when you say apostolic, oh, it's 
four walls of a church apostolic. That's not how it is so. You see, they are diversities, the Bible says, of gifts, but the same what? Spirit. Diversities of operations, the Bible says, but the same spirit. So there are diversities of operation, but it's the same person of the Holy Spirit. So he's not limited to the four walls of the church. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, going deeply into that, then we get into the aspects of society that sometimes the four walls are not able to touch or uh, address. And so we are efficient in our four walls of the Sunday service and the things that we are told on Sunday. But many a time when we go out in the world, we, we, we are not efficient. We are not useful. We are not applicable. And so you have a bunch of believers who go every Sunday to church, sit under a man or woman of God, taught well. But when they go in the business world, when they go in the political world, when they go... You know, in the educational world, when they go in the media, they, they have no purpose. They have no direction. They have no course. They have no vision. They are only aligned to the laws and, and, and principles that rule the world, but they're not able to carry what is in the four walls to go outside. And that, in part, is the responsibility and shortfall of us who are ministering to people because the vision of the church in many ways has been so short-sighted. And because of that, there is no difference between the Christian and the people of the world in how we, you know, in how we deliver, in how we perform, in how we bring the results that are necessary. And that is the conversation that I want to have with you and probably change the narrative as I provoke your spirit to have the vision of God concerning wealth and business and what God has called you to do in these circles. So I'll give you an example, typical example. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, one man stands out with a unique anointing in human history, and that was Joseph. We don't see, for example, that Joseph could open blind eyes. We don't see, for example, that Joseph could open deaf ears. We don't see the, you know... Uh, exponential grace of the miraculous on his life, like you could see on the life of Elijah or Elisha. He didn't command fire from heaven. He did not float axes. He did not cast boys because they laughed at him bald hair. It wasn't, he wasn't that kind of man. You don't see Joseph as a prophet. Okay, we call him a dreamer, but to what extent? What exactly is unique about Joseph? This is exactly what is unique about Joseph. He has a dream. And he sees the stars, the moon, and the sun bowing to him. You remember the story? And then he comes and tells his father that I see the stars, the moon, and the, and the sun bowing to me in a dream. And his father is disturbed. He said, what are you saying? Are you saying that your father, your mother, and your brothers are all going to bow to you? He rebuked him. And I'll tell you, his father did not mind him and his authority over his brethren because predominantly he loved his son. The Bible says he called him the son of his old age. But he had a problem that what was on Joseph was going to make him as a father bow to the son. That disturbed him. You see, I'm talking about that place where your dream sort of disturbs natural order and you know, at the end of the day, questions many things in the order of men, as you know it. In this instance, the sun, the moon, and the stars were to bow to one man who? Joseph. So God evidently has told us that he has chosen this man above all his brethren. Very clear. And when he starts to speak his dream, the Bible says his brethren, what? Hate him. Why? Because he is speaking a language of, of overtaking them, of being above them. And so, if you're reading that story for the first time, you're curious, how is that going to look like? Because, um, like I said, many of the examples we have seen in the Bible have different uh, connotations of how this pans out. And then we see them hate him, and then we see him one day bring them food, 
and then they beat him up and tear his clothes and throw him in a ditch and one of the brothers is saying uh, let's spare this guy some of them say let's kill him the conversation you know and then you know one guy comes and says okay let's sell this guy to the merchants and then they sell him he is found in the house of Potiphar are you following the story is found in the house of Potiphar, and then, you know, a challenge happens. A woman of Potiphar's wife accuses him falsely, and then the next thing we know, he's in prison, and he's interpreting dreams, but those little dreams are smaller than the bigger dream. And the Bible says, and then Pharaoh dreamed a dream. Right? And you, you know the story, many of you, the seven years, of plenty and the seven years of luck. He doesn't know what it means and they have to bring this guy out through the butler who remembers that he interpreted his dream right and then he's before Pharaoh. And then he tells him there are going to come seven years of plenty in the interpretation of that dream. And after those seven years are going to come another seven years of luck. So God is telling you that store up uh, enough food for the seven years of plenty such that in the seven years of famine you will not what uh, lack food and it's interesting joseph told pharaoh get a man he did not say get me and then pharaoh tells him i see no man in whom the spirit of god is i don't know whether let me try to get it if you get there faster, you help me because of time. I'm, I'm trying to skip a lot because... Uh, uh, amen. The story is somewhere in Genesis 41. Genesis 41. Thank you. 48? 38. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And Pharaoh said... Yes, 4138. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? This is what I wanted to emphasize. Pharaoh designed that to have enough wisdom to store enough food for seven years, you needed a man who had the Spirit of God. Not a man who knew finances, not an economist, not a fiscal planner, uh, not a mathematician, not even an agriculturalist, yet we're having a conversation about food, but he says he wants a man in whom the spirit of God is. Are you following? And the Bible says, and Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, he says, There is none discreet and wise as thou, and thou shalt be over my house according to thy word. Shall my people be ruled only in the throne? Will I be greater? And Pharaoh said, I have set you, Joseph, above Egypt. Very important. So, Joseph is made governor of Egypt. And now we see a man who was in prison, a man who has no history of finances, a man who has no history of training in economics whatsoever, because we see his history with, a, with his family. He is a young man, he's not old enough, so we cannot speak about experience. And he is put in some of the highest, or if not actually the highest office of the land. And Pharaoh is trusting him, not because of his credentials, because he has not proved him yet. But this boy has a spirit of interpretation. And in that, Pharaoh sees wisdom and a spirit at work on this man's life bigger than the economist can give, bigger than the mathematician can give, bigger than your fiscal planner can give. So he sets him over what? Over the realm of Egypt. And indeed, 
we see for the seven years, Joseph did all that was supposed to be done in the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit. And after the seven years of plenty, when we get to the seven years of lack, this is amazing. When famine hit, it did not hit Egypt only. It hit the world. It only took a man with the Spirit of God to know that you are going to work with a, 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 a limited resource of land of Egypt, but you're not storing up for Egypt, but you're storing up for the world. That only the Holy Spirit can give. Because when he was interpreting to Pharaoh, he did not converse, have a conversation with him concerning the need of the world. He only ended in the conversation of Egypt. But when he is put in charge, he does not store for Egypt, but he stores for the world. How do we know famine hit the world? Because we see men come from Israel, his brethren are all coming to Egypt looking for one thing. What? Food. Isn't it? Is it? In fact, when you start the scripture down, you realize that not only did they sell food, but in the year of famine, Egypt became the richest nation across in the world at that time because they had food which the whole world did not have. He made Egypt the richest nation because he stored enough food for the world. It takes the spirit of God for him to have the right trajectory to know how many people are supposed to eat, how many people he's actually planning for. That only he has with the God he serves and the spirit of God operating on his life. And then we see how his brothers come, and then he sees them. The reunion comes through, the reconciliation of all things. They weep. He tells them, do not cry, for God has sent me ahead of you for the preservation of your posterity. And God puts Joseph above his family. Are we following me? And then eventually, the scriptures tell us that later on, the Egyptians, sorry, Joseph brought his father's household too. Egypt and the Egyptians thrived and thrived and thrived and thrived and thrived generation upon generation. Why do we later hear the children of Israel in bondage with Pharaoh and, and, and no, the children of, of Israel in bondage? Later on, if you read scripture, you will see that the people go to Pharaoh and tell him the Egypt, the Israelites have become richer than us and greater than us in number. And he says, if we don't do something about these people, they are going to take over what? Egypt. So let us put burdens on them and slave them. But you see, the Bible says, later, a king arose that knew not Joseph. Did you, have you ever read it? A king arose that knew not what? Joseph. Know his works. And because he did not respect the anointing, or no, understand the spirit at work, he did not understand the spirit that made Egypt a success. He did not understand the spirit that made Egypt rich in the time of famine, the richest nation in the world. He did not understand the wisdom that made the, the Israelite or the Jew richer than them in their own land. His eyes are on these people are a success and they are going to bring us trouble. And that's how they put the children of Israel into what? Bondage. So we see, one, not only Joseph making a whole nation rich by the wisdom of God operating on his life, but we see that generations were preserved of a posterity for hundreds of years and principles were birthed in the lineage and, 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 and raw of the, of the Jew Certain secrets were passed on family to family, and these people became a success family upon family, generation upon generation, and the Egyptian does not have a clue why these people are a success. He has no clue why these people are a success. And this is what I believe, and all of you can agree with me, that I believe when Joseph gets the family of Israel in, he starts to teach them certain things. He starts to instruct their spirits to certain spaces. 
And even though Egypt was not originally their land, even though they were not advantaged like the Egyptian, even though they did not seem like they had an inheritance in Egypt, for Egypt belongs to the Egyptian, even though they were not advantaged in that land because there were visitors in that land, they started to make more wealth and amass more power than the people who owned that land and knew all the corners and mysteries of that nation. That only the person of the Holy Spirit can do. Somebody shout hallelujah. But what makes it a unique conversation and why I'm going to delve so deep into this conversation is because for once we have seen a man that has not only redeemed his father's household, we have seen a man in whom the spirit of God is, we have seen a man who has changed the nation and changed his own people and he's not doing it like any other men and women of God were reading in Bible. He's not fighting wars on the forefront. He is not raising widows' orphans, but by the Spirit of God, he's building economies. And not only is he changing nations, but he is changing households, generation upon generation, until his legacy is forgotten. For as long as his name was mentioned and the king understood the ways of Joseph, they always favored the Jew. Those are not conversations that we have in church. I, and I have a problem with our pastors because every time they preach Joseph's story, they're talking about the pit, the, the prison. They're talking, they're talking about the dream. And that's where they are. They're around the dream and the pit and Joseph and Joseph and the pit. And you can be rejected. You have a spirit of rejection. You understand? In fact, if Joseph lived in 2022, he would have a spirit of rejection. He'll be under deliverance, fire. You know, how can your brothers hate you? Huh? What is on you? What is wrong with you? How can your family hate you? How can you be this? No, 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 no. God shows us that I can actually work through a man and build an economy. Now, if you're in this room, number one, I did not come to give you wisdom to change your family. <laughs> you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you are in the wrong room, definitely. Maybe it's next door, not this one. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to have conversations of dreaming for nations, planning for nations, Planning for states. That's the kind of conversation we want to get into. Hallelujah. He has spoken upon our lives that we shall be the heads and not the tails, above and not beneath. We shall go upward and forward only. Is that only going to happen in the pulpit when we're healing the sick and casting out devils? Yes, and not only. It has now to permeate our people which are in the work places. And our people must appreciate that the principles that govern wealth in the world are not the principles that govern wealth in the church. They have ways they do it. We have ways we do it. The only problem with the church today, and the Lord showed this to me many years ago, the people of the world have gotten our principles and left us our Bible. Are you hearing me? And the Christians have put conviction above principle and now we are having a problem that Christianity, the church, is not uh, demonstrating the kind of wealth that we are supposed to demonstrate in the earth. So we are the head in many ways as conversation and confession. But when it comes to the practical sense, our Christians are like any other ordinary people. In fact, even the people who are not believers have a more uh, a deeper working ethic. They have a bigger purpose and plan than than many of our believers today. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. What makes Joseph different? It's not the feeding of Egypt. It's the vision of the world. That's what makes Joseph different. It's not the planning or the food of Egypt. It's the vision of the world. It's the vision of the world. Let me give you an example. One day I was home reading about Elon Musk. Some of you know Elon Musk, don't you? I think now the richest man in the world. And I read about his SpaceX programs. I read about everything he's been doing. And not that I was not following him, but the Spirit of God deliberately instructed me to study him as a man and understand what is in his head. Number one. How many of you uh, knew 
that Elon Musk is on the autistic spectrum. Okay? Now, if you did not know now, you should know. In fact, he was diagnosed since childhood with Asperger's, I think, a sort of Asperger's. It's on the spectrum of autistic people. And one day in an interview, um, they asked Elon, what's the secret of how brilliant your brain works? And he said, there was no way I could have done these things if I had a normal brain. I had to be a bit autistic. <laughs> As though implying that the most successful people must be autistic, which is not so. But he was trying to, now the ardent student, to help us understand that only different minds do certain things in the world. Because many people are very conformable. They think within the box. They don't think outside the box. And thinking outside the box, I'm not just talking about a great idea. Thinking outside the box is the power of vision. Now, I'm going to go deep here. So, in a world of 8 billion people, there's a man who asked a question and said, what if a nuclear bomb was to hit the earth? Or perhaps one day we woke up to one of the worst disasters of climate change and the world hits up to a place where it's not habitable for human beings. And not that it can be or would be, but he supposed that kind of conversation. And he went into the mind of planning to say, if one day Earth is not habitable, we must create habitable space outside the Earth. Jeff Bezos is having conversations of building cities in the sky, eco cities that are self-sustainable. You understand what I'm saying? Self-sustainable. And they're probably in this little glass, big, almost the size of a city, where your oxygen is provided by a self-sufficient automated system where plants can grow and people can eat and build civilizations, schools, hospitals, uh, homes and businesses and people can actually live in other spaces as whether that will come to pass before Christ returns or not. I cannot have a shadow of doubt in my spirit that it is possible. Let me tell you the secret that makes things possible. It is the power of language. Power of language. In Genesis, the Bible says something very powerful. Uh, he speaks of the day when people were fallen, were, were in the days of, uh, of Nimrod. Uh, in the days of Nimrod. And uh, the Bible says these people were one language and one speech. Genesis 11. The whole earth was one language and one what? Hmm? One speech. Are you following? And the Bible says, and they said, let's build a city to heaven. A building to heaven. Uh, if you read that story in the book of Jasher, which is an extra biblical text, but gives a deeper story of this history, the word heaven there, even when studied in Hebrew, was not heavens as of to go into the sky, Heaven was, the mind of Nimrod was to conquer God. So by conquering God, you needed to build a building that would reach him so you can uh, mobilize an army and it goes up and attacks him. That was the mind. You get, my, you get the mind? Now, where is God? And so when God comes down to these people, he says, let these people is one language and one speech. And he says, and now nothing they imagine to do. Verse 6. These people is one and they have one language. Uh -huh. Read. They all have one language. And this is, this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Nothing they imagine to do will be withheld from them. The King JV says nothing that they imagine to do will be restrained or held back from them. These people have the same language and they have the same speech. The language during that time is Hebrew. It's ninth dimensional. It can create anything. 
That's why the Old Testament is in Hebrew language. You see? It's a sacred language. And so, nothing they imagine to do will be held from them. Why? These are opposed to God. They are non-believers. This is Nimrod's team, the guy that brought back demonic worship after the fall of Noah. But he says, because they have the power to imagine, and unfortunately the church only ends in the power of imagination, but does not respect, give due respect to the power of language and speech, he says, nothing they imagine to do will be impossible with them. Why? Because they have a language and a speech. So God says, the only way we can stop these people is to go down and confound their languages. And that's what he had to do. But let me help us, give us a clue of what that means, men and women of God. The earth has different levels, right? You have the troposphere, where you dwell, where you have your oxygen, 8 to 12 kilometers from the earth. You have the stratosphere, 50 kilometers after the, after the earth. You have the mesosphere, which is 85 kilometers. You have the thermosphere, which is 1,000 kilometers. You have the exosphere, which is 190,000 kilometers. And, and, and it goes on different spheres, different spheres. Now, let's just talk about the exosphere. And that's not where God dwells, but that's 190,000 kilometers from the earth. And that's not where God dwells. Are you following Men are sending us uh, 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 video from the moon, which is about what? 130 something thousand, kilo, 80,000 kilometers away from the earth. God is saying, these people want to build to heaven, and it is possible. Perhaps heaven is light years far. But God is saying, because they have language, it is possible. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not men functioning under the spirit of God, but I want to show you the latent power of the human spirit. So I need you to understand what that should become if they had the spirit of God. No wonder men like Isaiah would by the spirit close their eyes and in the next moment they are in heaven. And do, if you want to know the power of a seeker and a searcher. Do you know that it was not a divine appointment of Isaiah to go to heaven that day? Read the narrative. He says, in the day King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I entered the heavens and I saw the sea, I saw the glassy sea, I saw the beauty there. And he says, and I heard a voice saying, whom shall we send? That is evident that the Godhead, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that is Elohim, were in conversation of a man they were going to send. They had not invited Isaiah in a meeting, otherwise God would have started that conversation with him. Are you following? Isaiah was not in that meeting. But he, by the Spirit of God, broke into heaven, and he finds a meeting, and he just says, send me. You don't even know where they're sending or what they're sending, but he says, send me. Evidently, this is not a man who God had invited in a conversation. This is a man who, by the Spirit, broke into the heavenlies. That's why uh, on the side of the church, if the church ever understands our place in the Spirit, many of you will realize that heaven is not only a place you're invited into, it's a place you can actually visit if you understand the liberties of the Spirit. But that's for another day. It's not for this uh, congregation. Are you following what I'm saying? And as I'm speaking this, I want you to ask yourself the question, where is the Christian? Huh? Because somebody probably, oh, your brain is, how can I improve my business? Mm. Wow. <laughs> you see, eh? let's get here. So, God has given so much potential to these men. Now, there is a man in the world planning for where humanity would dwell if the earth had a problem. He's on the same planet with a man who is in a Sunday morning church on his knees weeping, asking for a breakthrough to pay his debt. Have you asked yourself why Elon Musk is now the richest man in the world? Because there are laws in the universe that favor such visions whether you're born again or not. 
whether you believe in God or not, there are laws in the universe that favor certain visions, that provide for certain visions. Bill Gates, why did he give to the world? Computers, Windows, the operating system. He dreamed for the world. Are you following? And then you ask yourself why for a long time he was the richest man. Mention the Zuckerbergs of this world. Facebook. If Facebook was a church, how many, how many, let me ask you people, probably I need to help you understand. How many uh, subscribers does Facebook have? If anybody knows here. You Indians know better. I'm not on Facebook. Help me somebody. How many, you can even Google it. How many subscribers does Facebook have? Huh? Hmm? Yes, more than 2 billion. But I wanted exact, we can get that on the internet. 2.91 billion. That's how many followers Facebook has in the world. Who here knows the total number of Christianity on the face of the earth? 2.7 billion people are Christians on record. And 1 billion of that is Roman Catholic. That's why the Pope is represented in the UN. When you get the total of the Pentecostals, you guys who scream a lot and cast out devils and pray the whole night and speak in tongues and have filthy attitudes and over-inflated uh, egos... Your total across the world does not go beyond 800 million. So, practically speaking, Zuckerberg has more followers than the Christian faith. And then we ask ourselves why we are not touching the world. Maybe because you're dreaming for your homes. You're dreaming for your village. You grew up in a poor house and every time you went to school, your mother slapped you and told you, Pah! Kumal, you have to study so hard because you need to change your family. And you remember that every day. And now you are trying to change your family. You hear that your wife might have a meal and your children might have a decent education. <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> Christianity. <laughs> You're following what I'm saying? Today, I in the few minutes I have, I don't want to help you improve your business. I want to change your vision by the grace of God. So by the time you walk out of this room, even your prayer has changed. When I went into the pastoral or ministry church, this is what I asked God. I asked God that I'll dream for the world. I asked for the world. I didn't ask for a big church in Uganda. No. I asked for the world. That's what I asked for. And there's a law in the universe that is providing for that reality. Every other day, I am touching the world. I'm the first Ugandan to be on TBN, East African and North Africa. I'm the first Ugandan to be on God TV. I'm the first Ugandan to be on an Indian television. I'm the first I'm the first. But you see, my head here, when you enter this head right here, it's not thinking of building a big church. No. I have a message for the world and something is telling me every other day I am providing for that vision and its interpretation. People in this room listening to me, you might not even be owning your, your business right now. Perhaps you might be a faithful worker, a clerk, a supervisor in your workplace or wherever God has called you to be. But I want to provoke your spirit to dream and dream for the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. If you go technical, there will always be a guy outside in the world who is more technical than you are. Yes, if you want to apply your science and physics, there will always be somebody more scientific than you are. But there's something about the language that is supposed to make the Christian different. And soon I'm preaching this even in my home church, but let me give you a clue. 
You see, hey, did I say languages are dimensional? Languages are dimensional. Your Hebrew, like I said, is nine. Latin is eight. Greek coin is seven. Aramaic is, which is your Arabic, right? Is, is six, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And on. So, you have the lethargic languages in the world, which are one side, and then you have the pragmatic languages in the world, which are the other. The pragmatic either borrow from the lethargic because they are one or two dimensional. You understand what I'm saying? The lethargic define the world. They define the world. And you must understand it. Why do you think Arabic gave us al numerals, Arabic numerals? Huh? That means before... The Arabs came many a time. Some of us did not know how to even count. Are you following? Algorithm. It's Arabic. But you are designing a computer language with your algorithm, but you don't know that there is a language that facilitated the algorithm. That is why a pragmatic language could not build a four-story building because they don't have the engineering language. Are you following? So in God splitting these languages, many of them were melted down. For the purpose then, your physics is limited, and some of you don't respect the power that took you to school. The power that took you to school was to elevate your pragmatic language into and connect you to the rest of the lethargic languages and their creations. If you got your mom or brother or auntie who didn't go to school, and then you told them, <laughs> uh, use a computer. They will not understand because they never had the opportunity to separate your software and your hardware. They never had the opportunity to know how a computer works and how the keyboard is set and why this, tab, this, this is F1 and F2 and why it's escaped. They don't know the control, out, delete. They don't know the shortcuts of a computer. They cannot understand the operating system and how it works. But to know that there is one man in the world who does not know how a computer works, and there's another man in the world who is creating a computer and that software is amazing. Look at that chasm, that world of difference. And the difference between these two men is language. And because many of you are Asians, like you are uh, Africans, we are more progressively learning from the other languages, we find that the inventions and innovations that we do are only progressively learned as we are adjusting to the languages that are given. That is why when you say you're going to translate the Bible from the Hebrew huh, to your Telugu text, it means the more you translate, because there are words in Hebrew that you cannot translate in Telugu or my Luganda. You agree? For example, who knows the word Zoe? Zoe is what? That's Greek, right? Uh huh. How do you say Zoe in your language? You'll find yourself making a statement, interpreting it. You'll find yourself translating it in the interpretation. You'll find yourself saying, the life of God. You see, but you have no word. And this word is only three letters. But if, you, if I told you to translate it, you will find yourself making a statement of what to the Jew, or Greek, sorry, is one word. That means you are limited in function, that what he does for one word, you will need eight or nine syllables. Spiritually, you're slower. And whether you believe it or not, there are certain intricate words in, the, in language that you are not able to understand and interpret. There are certain concepts that you're not able to understand. So does that shock you why Bill Gates is Jew? Or why Zuckerberg is Jew? Hmm? You understand what I'm saying? I saw an Israeli recently, he designed headphones that are wireless and not connected to anything, and neither are they, let me explain. He connects this system on a TV, and it sends sound to you, yet you're not wearing anything. Anything. 
and it can direct, it has an omnidirectional capability of sending that sound only to you, that the person next to you cannot hear anything. And the guy who desires it is Jew. I don't get shocked. I don't get shocked. How long did it take India to enter? The, you, I think the, 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 the third the industrial revolution has happened in India through technology, isn't it? But you have come third. So there are two more industrial revolutions that have happened before you. And the fourth industrial revolution has been confirmed to happen in Africa. But why did Africa come forth? Why weren't we the first? Language. Language. It took a unique language. I've seen Indian buildings, those old things. I've studied your old buildings that, that are built with such science. And it's amazing. But you can't find such buildings in Africa because we didn't have the language to build a building with clay and make it storied. Somebody had to bring engineering from another country to bring it in my nation. You see what I'm saying? So you have a bit, uh, richer language than my language. You, you following what I'm saying? No. The Bible came to give us a language. So when God says you shall be the head and not the tail, it can only be translated by the power of language. You must be able to connect to some interpretation in the spirit realm as was at work in Joseph to be able to have a unique interpretation of life because like I said it's all in the power of language and the interpretation of that language to the world of men. What Joseph did for Pharaoh was just interpret. The vision was of Pharaoh. But Joseph interpreted it. It's called the law of translation. The power that gets the things that are in the spirit and brings them to the physical realm. You either know it or you don't. All these other processes that we go through in the earth are all following that law. And then no matter how many visions and ideas you have in your head, if you don't know how to appropriate it, you'll never be able to manifest what you have in your spirit. That's why many people die with dreams and they're not able to translate them into the world. Firstly, because even the vision is small, but too many of them are not attached to the purpose of that vision. The Bible says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. But number two, underline this in capital and italicize it or bold it to those who are called according to his purposes. Have you found purpose in this thing you call business yet? Have you found purpose beyond survival? Have you found purpose beyond prestige? Oh, I'm building this. And sometimes wisdom fails us when we start to build for prestige because that shows <laughs> wounded consciences that are marked with poverty and trying to step into certain spaces. And even to men who are thinking, we find that we are spending and are spent for the things that are not even beneficial. You understand what I'm saying? Why would you have 12 rolls roses because God has blessed you? What's wrong with you? What are you going to do with all of them? You understand? Why would you have 12 Mercedeses? Well, what are you going to do with all of them? Are they going to transport everybody? Are you going to sit in all of them? Uh, why do you have 20 Rolexes and 13 Tag Hewers? What's wrong? You understand what I'm saying? Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Huh? Oh, I'm going to build rentals. But I'm building rentals because they really are going to bring the return of investment better than any other investment that you can invest in. Or you're building rentals because you want people to pass by and say, Haha, Ooh, he made it. Look at those. Look, you come and see his rentals. Four levels, ten levels, you see. Very rich man. All of those, they give him money every month. 
when I was in the bank as a business analyst. And we realized one of the worst investments to do in Uganda is rental. Rental business. And we didn't know how to explain to people that even if a person did not build rental business, if you built rentals, we did the math and realized you needed to at least 25 to 27 years to get firstly the monies that you have invested in that rent. And the only thing you have to rely on is the value of the land and which can change due to many aspects, political or otherwise. And I told the man a simple analogy and I tell him if you get this million dollar and put it in a bank at an interest rate of X per month, we showed him that you can actually get that money back in the next seven years. That means if in those seven years I can fix my money and then you go building, are you hearing me? You're going to get your money back in 27 years and I'm going to get mine in seven. That means if we had seven times, times two, that is 14 years, I'll have double, which is 14, and you will still be almost half of what you're supposed to receive at the end of life. And it's hard for them to understand it because... This guy came from a poverty-stricken family, and his mindset is like that. And prestige. He has rentals on a street. You understand what I'm saying? But unless this man has a certain spirit on him, his feet will not be guided to the right investment. Do you know God, even in business, has conditions on how you should invest? You remember the parable of talents? You remember that story? One man brought back ten talents. Another one made five talents. And one said, oh, you know, I knew that you were a master who is shrewd in your business and you reap where you have not even sown. And so I kept your talents. I would not waste it. And then the master tells him, you have a problem. Why? Because if you knew that I was a master shrewd in business and I even want to earn more than I have invested, then you should have been wiser to put your money in the bank for my usury that I might have interest. That means that the least investment you can make if you don't have enough wisdom, at least don't invest anything below what a bank can give you for interest rate in a year or a month. That's the least. It's wisdom. And if you do any business and it cannot give you that or above, you're already in the wrong business. You have frustrated the law of business. In any aspect, it doesn't matter whether it takes 10 or 20 years, it will have a problem. No business is as, can be as divinely blessed as a business that will earn either at least the percentage of what a bank is able to give you for interest for depositing that money, the highest it could give you, or anything above. And then somebody invests less than what a bank can give them interest, and they are asking the hand of God to bless it. It's not possible. You have floated the principle. Are you following what I'm saying? But not only the Spirit of God can reveal, because I didn't read it in a book. I didn't hear it on a CD. I never had a man speak it. I read it and the Lord gave me wisdom. And I knew that I would never invest above what a bank can give me for interest a year. I don't do it. And when I do that, I realize I don't lose in any business I invest in. I do my math early. Are you seeing? Many other things are going to come like that. There are things we, we might sit here and start giving you the wisdom of the world. Things that any investment banker would know. Things that like any economist, economist would know. Things any you know, any, any business consultant will know. And that's not where we are supposed to be as Christians. We're supposed to transcend the realms of how men think and make wealth. It's the only way we can become heads and not tails. Are you agreeable? Now, so, the Bible came to give us a unique language. When he said you are the head and not the tail, he meant I'm going to give you a language higher than Greek or Hebrew. When he says you're more than a conqueror by Christ, I've given you another language. When he says I shall supply all your needs according to my riches in glory in Christ Jesus, he has given you another language. But many people don't see that language. They only claim a promise. 
and fail to understand that there is an underlying principle of language God wants to give us. And it goes into how we confess, it goes into how we think, it goes into how we dream, it goes into how we position ourselves, it goes into the diligence of the spirit, it goes to the prudence of the man, it goes to many aspects that make the Christian holistic. If we are not having those conversations, we are wasting time. God is not going to come from heaven and put man on our accounts. It's not going to work. Because wealth does not exist in the prayer realm only. Otherwise, people who didn't pray would not be wealthy. But we have seen that even people who don't know God are wealthy, meaning that it's not in the prayer realm, it's in the wisdom realm. That's why I said yesterday that the wisest man was the richest. But you see, this was a spirit of God operating on his life. And that is the thing that the Christian is choking and settling for the wisdom and substitutes of the earth. I, let me tell you a little story about me. Very little. Do you know I made a million dollars in one year? Why? My eyes were open to how the world makes money and I realized it was a lie. It was a lie. Some of you think you're going to work slowly. Yeah, by yeah. Apply yourself. And then eventually, you'll make wealth. Yeah. The world does it that way, and it's okay. But you see, when you read the language of God, and it tells you, for example, let me give you a typical example. When you read something like vineyards you did not plant, what does that mean? Is that a realm of labor? Answer me. Houses you did not build, is that a realm of labor? It's not a realm of labor. Not all success is in the realm of labor, and I'm not against labor. I'm a hard worker. I go to bed late, and I wake up early, because I'm a hard worker. I believe in hard work. All my pastors are working. I don't have a, a pastor who's not working. I don't, I, don't, I don't appoint you as a pastor if you don't have a source of income. I'm not interested. Because if you can't look after your household, you bring a problem in the church. So I believe in that. You see? But what I'm trying to tell you here is, I'm telling you about things that are beyond money. That's why Isaiah says, come without money and buy. What a language! So he has told us that there is a way we can actually buy without money. Do you know how to buy without money? Or oh, everything you bought, you bought with money. That's why you're not successful. Because not everything you're going to buy with money. You need to know the language that gets these things from that realm to this realm. That's what I'm trying to tell us. But the purpose has to be reconciled to it. And this is the purpose. But you must dream for the world. God only blesses that. Let me give you an example. David went to God and said, I want to build you a city, a temple. Temple. And God refused to give David a temple. David bought everything necessary to build a temple. God did not give him the temple. What did he give him? He gave him the city. Then he built the city. And then he said, your son will build a temple. Why? God is trying to get into his head to tell him, I can only build a temple in a city I gave you. You understand what I'm saying? And there's a man who wants to build a temple in a city, but he has not the city. What do you think God wants to first give you? Do you think God wants to give you a successful business in India, or he wants to first give you India, then give you a successful business in India? What, what, what do you think is the order of God? In fact, when Solomon wants to build a church, he goes to the right hill and realizes that that hill was outside the city his father built. And what does the scripture say? He extended the boundaries of the city. That is why if you read church history, 70 AD, when the city is besieged, the temple falls. God does not watch over churches. He watches over cities, except the Lord watch over a city. The watchman watches in vain. He didn't say the church or your business. Now put your business in as, as the temple. Put your small investments as a temple. Are you following what I'm saying? God is not watching over your business in Chennai. No. He gives you authority over the realm of Chennai. And then watches Chennai for the sake of your business. Did you understand what I just said? He watches Hyderabad for the sake of your business. He doesn't watch your business. 
outside Hyderabad. And if you're asking for a big business in Hyderabad, you're making the wrong prayer. Ask for Hyderabad to respond to you. Are you following? Let's go deeper into this mystery. Maybe somebody did not understand it. You remember in Genesis? When Cain killed Abel, hmm? you remember Cain killing Abel? Let, let's, go, let's go there a little bit. I, I want to show you something before I finish. When Cain killed Abel, Jesus Christ. Sorry, I'm an ancient minister. You know what that means? Huh? I speak from... I, I, I speak as the Spirit gives utterance, so I don't write notes. Yeah? Sorry. So, I, I'm just speaking as the Lord is giving utterance. Eh? Not that I didn't prepare. No, I prepared in prayer. Some people think preparation is writing notes. No, preparation is not writing notes. Preparation is writing, preparing your spirit to hear God. That's preparation. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4, verses 10. God asks Cain, what have you done? And the voice of thy brothers crieth unto me from the ground. Next verse. And now art thou cast, listen, from the earth which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. You're cast from the earth which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood. Next verse. When you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield into you, unto thee her strength. And because of that, it tells him, a fugitive and a vagabond thou shall be on the earth. Do you know what a vagabond is? A vagabond is a beggar. He says, a fugitive, restless, and vagabond shall be on the earth. Why? Because the land shall not yield forth her strength to you. That means if the land does not yield its strength to you, you will be a beggar. It's not the will of God to beg, even borrow. It's not the will of God. Because the Bible says, he that borroweth is a servant to the lender. That is why I command whatever spirit has been around debt on your life, I command it to leave you today at the sound of my voice. The first thing God is going to relieve you of is debt. You will not walk in debt because you are a subject to the one who has lent you. Why do you think in nations like America you are forced to have a credit card because spiritually you are supposed to be enslaved? UK, that is why they all go with dreams to change the world and all of them are suffocated by the system. They don't make it in their 60s or 70s. That's when they wake up and realize they have made a mistake and they only come back home to die. The system has swallowed everyone. I've never seen a, an African who has gone to the UK and, and changed it. I'm yet to see an Indian who went to the UK and changed it. Because they are all subject to the queen. That's why I can't live in England. Even if you pay me money. I can't. I can visit, preach, do some business there, actually do business there, but I don't, I cannot live in a place. You understand what I'm saying? They don't have that nation. Spiritually, there is a curb beyond which they are able to go except if they learn to break through by prayer. Otherwise, all of our people who went there, they are all surviving in debt. Either they are in a house is in debt. They are, I went to America once with a guy, and then he said, I want to take you for a movie. And I finished preaching. I said, okay, the little boy in me switched on. I said, okay, let's go for a movie. Then we reached there, and the guy gave a credit card. I said, what, what, what is going on? You're paying for a movie. Even movies on credit. Somebody shout, fire. fire. Even movie, Bishop, is on credit. Two, three dollars. How, how fuck? I'm telling you, I found it in America. The chair is on credit. The TV is on credit. The mobile phone is on credit. The hairpiece is on credit. Everything is on credit. What do you have? I thank God I'm not indebted to any man in the world. <laughs> I refused it in Jesus' name. I will follow it. So anyway, back to the story. So he said the land will not yield forth its fruit. When you see beggars on the streets, especially guys who have both hands and fingers and feet, the land is not yielding its strength to them. They're either vagabond, restless, living one room to another, or beyond that, they are 
surviving. So when I told you ask for Hyderabad, or ask for India, or ask for the world, I'm saying the world can yield its substance to you. That wherever you go, the world is responsive to you. Some time ago, the Holy Spirit prompted me to buy a certain property, and I bought it. And the government, a few months later, realized, announced that, that under that property there is oil. <laughs> you understand those things? The earth is yielding its substance. The earth is yielding its what? Substance. The earth is yielding its strength to you. If you're an agriculturalist, when you plant, it will reap. If you go and start a business anywhere in Hyderabad, they will come to it. So, you know, Christians get this myopic thinking, oh, these are demons, the devil, the devil is disturbing me, my neighbor is using witchcraft, me, I'm not using witchcraft, so all of them are going to my neighbor. What? 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 Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. Yet you have the power to bind on the earth and it is bound in heaven or loosened on the earth and it is loosened in heaven and you're still telling me that somebody is using a God that doesn't talk, that just sits in front of the house like this and it's, and it's disturbing your business and then you find a Christian say, fire, you spirit, I break you, you will not break my business. Oh, you've actually belittled yourself to that level. You're fighting little gods which know who you are. Are you following what I'm saying? And some Christians are there. They find things in, be, in, in the office, they refuse, they send fire, and then, you know, at some point even the witchcraft affects them and breaks their leg, and then they start walking, and they say, there's somebody who sent witchcraft on my leg. You, you. <laughs> and, 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 and God looks at where you are instead of dreaming for the world, and he's like, wow. Stay there. <laughs> Enjoy your drama with the little small gods that you can even push off a chair and they fall. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. I'm concluding now. What I have been trying to do for the past one hour or so was to elevate your vision. Because the problem is not your business. The earth doesn't know what to yield strength to because you carry not the wisdom. Lastly, how, how many of you know that there are people who have sacrificed their children for wealth? Put up your hands. If you know that there are some people in the world who have sacrificed their children for wealth, put up your hand. You don't know? I'm saying, how many of you know that there are people who have sacrificed their children for wealth? You know it? Huh? I always ask myself, how does such a man stand next to a Christian who can't even tithe? Bishop, that thing has failed me to understand it. How can such a man stand next to a Christian who cannot even tithe? And you're speaking in tongues also asking God to bless you. I don't understand it. Maybe you do. Me, I don't. When we make wealth, we are supposed to advance the kingdom of God through our wealth. But because, like I said, many of our visions are myopic, we are ending on our families. Go beyond and understand. Let me tell you, I give close to 70% of my annual income in the kingdom of God. That's me. And I'm still a millionaire. You understand what I'm saying? So if you ever hear me do something big in Africa, don't blame me. Understand. The anointing on your life might not be to make a lame man walk or open a blind eye, but it could be making money for the kingdom. Like Joseph. 
made wealth for Egypt through the wisdom of storing food for seven years. And in the next seven years, everyone bought food from Egypt. But imagine if Joseph's vision was on his family and his wife and his uh, Range Rover. You see what I'm saying? And you know why many of you can never become rich? Your heart thinks so small concerning the things of the kingdom. And that's proof that it doesn't matter how much money you have on the account. Inside there, you're a poor man. Because your vision is small. You're not poor because of the money on your account. You're poor because of the smallness of your vision. Make money and learn to build a kingdom with wealth too. Because you're telling God that I'm doing this for a bigger purpose. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why the Bible says when Paul is praying for, for, for the church. And, and, and the, you remember the church in, in uh, Philippians? When he says, when you read the earlier verses, Paul says, I thank you, O church of Philippians, the Philippians, because you have communicated to me in the needs of the kingdom. Huh? And then the next line later he says, and because of that I have prayed that may my God supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That is to the Philippian church because it was contributing to the kingdom. And then you find a guy who doesn't tithe and is claiming the scripture. When you come in the church of Jesus, you give pocket change. You know those few coins you got from the tuk-tuk. Eh? Then you get the coins and you say, thank you Jesus. And then you're saying, my God shall supply all my needs. What? You understand what I'm saying? That's not how it works. That's why in my church I told people, listen, you can come in a helicopter. I'll give you the back seat in my church. I'm not interested. That's the truth. Those who know me will tell you. You come in a helicopter and they'll give you a back seat. Because I give value to men who are building the kingdom. I don't give value to rich people. I give value to men who understand that the kingdom of God must be built. And that is why I tell even the pastors here, don't put value on money. Put value on the heart of the giver. You remember the widow of the might? You remember the widow of the might? She had a might huh? or a button and just got it and gave it to God. And then there was this rich other person. Who can give one or 10,000 rupee, but he has lakhs and lakhs and lakhs? You see what I'm saying? Who is the bigger giver? Who is the bigger giver? Exactly. If a man earns $2,000 and he can give $500 of his $2,000, and you earn a million dollars a month and you're giving $10,000, who is giving better? Yes. So why are we giving the one who is giving $10,000 in front and the one of $500 behind? You understand what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? So for me, I don't attach the money. I, attach, I don't attach to value. I attach to the heart that gives. And, and, and I'm not, I cannot judge them because I don't know how much they earn. But you can judge yourself against that. You can allow God to examine you against that. Do you know in church we don't have big givers? Many of you are takers than you are givers. Do you know even these people who are sending agendas, eh? LGBT and what? They fund their faith more than the Christians fund the church. They believe it more than the Christian believes in the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? That narrative has got to change. At least I am a pastor. At least I thank God that I have some of the most generous people. The richest people in my church actually give big. And I thank God for that. I'm not like many other pastors. I'm not complaining. You see, but it was the only way we, we they understood it. And the more they gave, the richer they became. And the more they gave, the richer they became. Because you can never outgive God. But I'm talking to you who are business people listening to me and even tithing is a problem for you and you're dreaming for the world. You're not faithful in the little and you want God to give you more. You're in the wrong place. You're in the wrong place. 
Be faithful in the little. And you know, I don't want your money. I have not asked for money since I came. No. Don't get me wrong. I don't need money. I didn't give Bishop a bill to pay me for coming to India. No. No. I will pay for my ticket and come and preach if I have to. One time I was in America and this pastor told me, so how much honorarium can we give you, sir? And I told him, what I have in my spirit, you can't pay for man of God. You can't. I told him whether you give me or you don't give me, I am what? I am fine. Because every time I go to these American preachers, when they are giving the American preachers, they give them a lot of money. When they're giving us Africans, they give us like we are low maintenance. You understand what I'm saying? I so said, I don't even want their money. They keep it. Let me build my church. They will see. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now the biggest church in the world per capita is in Africa. It is no longer in America. Watch what's coming. Watch God, what God is going to do in India. Somebody shout hallelujah. The, the tables are turning. Yeah. They're in debt, we are not. And you know why a guy does it? Because I'm black. That kind of mentality. One time Bishop had to quarrel with some of them. He says, why do you treat him like this? Because he's this color. He has a problem with them also. And in my head I'm telling him, Bishop, tell them, tell them. You, have no good. you tell them. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. But what we're trying, trying to say here is, I have learned to abound. Like Paul says, if I'm instructed, be deliberate about wealth. Dream big and ask for a vision of the world. Give like you're dreaming for the world. Don't give like you're dreaming for your family. Give like you're dreaming for the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Speak to God to give you the language that translates things from the world unseen and the world that is seen. And then you'll see how this world is going to start bowing to our God. And the things that I've spoken are seeds that have been planted in your spirits. And this is what I believe. That God is watering them in the mighty name of Jesus. And they are going to bring forth fruit in your spirit that is going to echo through eternity. In Jesus' mighty name, I have prayed and believed and all sense said.